Why did you want to be a cosmonaut? <laughs> Honestly speaking, I don't know. Really, I don't know. Because um, I was almost five, then Yuri Gagarin flew. And I cannot remember uh, this flu. But uh, in half a year, in August of 1961, then German Titov flew. It was the second flight, a one day flight on board Vostok 2. So I can remember uh, this flight very well. And I was five. And I can say that uh, then I was uh, seven or eight. I have no doubts, and I'll be a cosmonaut. So now, uh, now I can uh, say that uh, maybe I was born with this wish. <laughs> not not wish, but maybe with this uh, yes, with this wish. So I don't know why. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it was an influence of my father. Maybe uh, something else. But. Uh, all my uh, childhood was uh, very close to the aviation issues because my father, uh, when he was young, uh, he was a navigator and he jumped with jumped with chutes and uh, he, but he uh, he wasn't a pilot. Then he he was a civilian engineer, but an excellent engineer, and uh, I was amazed at how uh, he solved uh, different technical problems, different from some homework to some inventions in his um, uh, on his work. It was amazing for me, and it's an uh, excellent example of an engineer. Uh, but uh, then I finished high school, uh, I decided, because uh, before that I had two choices uh, to be a cosmonaut, to, stay, to be a uh, military pilot or civilian engineer, because I saw that uh, the Soviet cosmonauts were either from military pilots or from civilian engineers. And I guess that uh, the civilian engineers, civilian cosmonauts, Soviet cosmonauts were from special organization. And later I knew that it was a uh, Karolev Design Bureau. Now it's called Enerke. So uh, I had the choice and, uh, and uh, first I decided to be a military pilot. But uh, later my father explained me that and I understood uh, by myself that uh, it's more interesting and maybe more valuable uh, to participate in designing and building spacecrafts and then fly, than to be uh, only to fly with uh, built by somebody planes. So I decided to be a civilian engineer in aerospace industry. And you had that in mind when you went when you went to university, yes. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. At the end of high school, I uh, saw I uh, look, I looked through the list of uh, institutes in the Soviet Union. It was a thick book, and I saw uh, one institute in Moscow, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, and one of the depart of departments was called Department of Air Physics and Space Research. And I thought, or oh, it's for me, and it's for me. And now I can say that I was lucky to be in many, many, many times in my life, I was lucky to be at the right time in the right place. <laughs> and that was the first example. That was the first time of this rule. We have a, uh, in English, we say it's better to be lucky than good. Um, so tell me about your, your career then. You went to this institute in Moscow, and, and tell me how that led you on into your, uh, your, your uh, place as a cosmonaut. You see, <laughs> it was very, very interesting, because then I entered the institute, um, and uh, during the first month of studying, um, we, 
we were fam we students were familiar with the system of education in this institute and uh, at the uh, third stage of education, last stage of education, we uh, had uh, many uh, activities uh, in uh, research centers, in uh, industrial enterprises. Uh, with uh, in in this area, in areas of our uh, specialities, and um, our group of students were tied to the Karolov Design Bureau. So it was, it's a fate. <laughs> <laughs> it's my fate. <laughs> so after uh, uh, then, I finished uh, my school. Uh, in the Karlov Design Bureau, I uh, had no doubts that I'll be working. I, I'd be working there. And after graduation, uh, I entered to work in 1979 to the Design Bureau. Uh, it was called uh, already Energia at that time. And uh, from that time, I am employer of Energia. Now it's a rocket and space corporation, Energia. And in that time, you've been an engineer? And yes, I was an engineer. Yes, I was an engineer. And, may and maybe uh, the previous selection uh, of cosmonauts w took place in uh, 1978, and I entered in 1979. And then uh, they started uh, to select a new team in 1981. I was among the first persons. <laughs> and, uh, in and in the 1984, I was selected, finally. I was selected, and now I'm a cosmonaut of energy. <laughs> the part of your job that involves you flying in space is a part that we know has its possible dangers. You've experienced that yourself in your career. But Alexander, what is it that you feel that we human beings, what is it that we are learning? What do we get as a result of flying people in space that makes it worth taking that risk? How to explain? How to explain uh, the necessity of uh, going behind the horizon? It's very human quality. So it's uh, maybe most valuable uh, frontier from human for humankind: space flights and going uh, into space and to the low or Earth orbit and into the deep space. Uh, so, I think, I cannot say anymore. It's uh, very valuable for humans, very valuable for humankind. Uh, but uh, how to explain it? Why, uh, why Magellan went around the world, around the Earth? Why? What kind of issue moved him? You're a member of the International Space Station's Expedition 25 and 26 crews. Alexander, can you summarize the overall goals of this six-month flight and tell me what your main jobs will be? Hmm. Um, the main goal is to, to keep the station in good shape and to maintain all the equipment working and uh, to perform a scientific program, a huge scientific program for of uh, all the international partners. But uh, personally, I will be I will responsible about the Russian program, of course, and maybe some uh, experiments in programs in, of different partners. Maybe, um, I'm not sure about US, but uh, definitely from European, not Japanese, um, so, and for me, mine, uh, for me personally, my uh, uh, main task will be uh, to test uh, the upgraded Soyuz in flight. 
So for me, the most important and most um, valuable uh, flight stages will be the uh, from the launch to the docking, <laughs> from undocking to the landing. <laughs> and uh, on the station will be the order for, for me. It will be ordinary stay with performing all the tasks. Very well known, well known for me. Now. Yes. Well, you have of course done a tour of duty on the International Space Station before, as well as uh, several visits to the Mir station. Uh, how do you compare a, a trip to this station as opposed to the Mir station? Decent. Huh. It's interesting. So, uh, it differs uh, in some details. Uh, you see, it's a new cooperation, a new rules, uh, new rules of op operational rules, new flight rules, uh, new relations between partners. Uh, so I think uh, this is the most uh, important and most uh, most uh, remarkable uh, differences between these two stations. Um, speaking in general. Uh, so, and uh, if uh, say about um, the uh, my previous flight to ISS, then I think that uh, uh, this stage of station will be um, much more complicated and uh, much more in uh, in the size. So uh, now we will have uh, at least. Uh, four or five uh, additional modules and cupola. Cupola is a uh, beautiful and wonderful air, air uh, to the earth and into space. <laughs> so I'm uh, looking, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to have a look from this window <laughs> to the earth to space. So I think, uh, I guess it will be exciting, uh, Syed. You mentioned a moment ago that you are also flying to the station on a new edition of the uh, Soyuz spacecraft. This has some upgrades from the uh, Tayaman model that has been in use since 2002. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? What is new about this Soyuz and how do these changes improve its performance? Uh, mainly uh, new changes uh, took place in avionics, take, take place in avionics. So we'll have new computer system, onboard computer system, new, new onboard computer. Uh, we'll have a, a controlling and informational bus joining uh, different computers in the uh, complex onboard computer complex. Uh, so we'll have some uh, more redundancies uh, in this case. We have we'll have a new telemetry system. So it's main, mainly in avionics, and uh, that is uh, the new uh, cosmonaut new crew interfaces like displays, like uh, some uh, information on displays, like. Uh, some lights, uh, some switches, and uh, so it's an uh, interesting version, and uh, I think that uh, the improving of Soyuz will uh, get us uh, new possibilities to improve it more and more, because uh, the main, uh, main issue is that now we'll have an open architecture of the computer system on board. Because uh, on the TMA version, like uh, in the older versions, we had a closed architecture. Now we'll have an open architecture, and we can, and we can improve and improve it. And continue to improve. Yes, in, and in, continue to improve. Future. Yes, yes, yes. It must be. It must be a, a, a nice thing to be have, have been selected to be the first to fly this new vehicle. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I'm proud of it. The. Soyuz you will fly is different. The station that you will arrive to, as you mentioned, is different than the one that you uh, visited on Expedition 8 and much different than the one that greeted Expedition 1 when they first arrived. And you shall be on board the station for the anniversary, the, the first 10 years of uh, full-time human occupancy on board uh, this space station. What 
do you think is the best thing that this partnership uh, has done so far in these past 10 years? Hmm. I think the most important thing is that we work together and we um, learned how to work together in close partnerships and close cooperation. Uh, I think this is the most important thing. And um, what else? It's a huge station with a new architecture, with uh, new possibilities. Uh, what else? Uh, and you see, it's very interesting because then I uh, talked with Sergei Krikalov after his uh, flight in Expedition 1. Uh, it was interesting because uh, maybe half a year before I flew with Sergei Zalotin to Mir station. It was the last flight to Mir. And uh, it was interesting because uh, our flight was like a small module of the uh, Expedition 1 on ISS because we had the same problems in um, activation of station, uh, in configuring some system in uh, maintaining, uh, so there were uh, so close um, features, so close details uh, in two both different flights that it was amazing. And now uh, I think that <coughs> we, we made a, a new uh, big step forward in the uh, utilization of, st not in the utilization of station, but in building, and now we are at the beginning of the real utilization of station, FISS, FISS. And it's, uh, I think it's the um, a new challenge for all the partnership to, to learn how to utilize the station in this cooperation. And I think that in the next 10 years, which shall we? Uh, what can we wait from this? I think that we'll perform uh, new amazing experiments. Maybe uh, for me, most valuable and most important is to perform experiments for uh, for improving uh, uh, human space flights. Maybe in techniques and methodology and uh, aiming to the interplanetary flights. It's the most valuable for me. So it's my, my waiting for this 10 years period. Let's talk a bit about the utilization that will happen now. There are, of course, a larger crew on board and many more uh, laboratory facilities. So there are a lot of experiments, and a lot of them have to do with finding out how people will be able to live and work in the microgravity environment, which we will need for those longer uh, explorations beyond Earth. Uh, tell me about some of the different kinds of investigations during your increment that you will be involved with as the research subject? As research subject, as research subject, it will be uh, mostly biomed experiments. So when, when my body will be under, and my brains will be under investigation. <laughs> Uh, honestly speaking, I, I don't like uh, very much uh, these experiments, but I understand that this is a necessity to, to, to go further and further in space flights. Uh, so, uh, for, for example, uh, our Russian research, uh, researchers will investigate the um, mentality or uh, the experiment so-called Typology. They will in investigate the possibilities of uh, our brains to to um, to organize the mental process and to help in solving uh, the problems uh, problems uh, n uh, in which is necessary to use uh, either uh, rational approach or emotional approach. So it's uh, some kind of psychological experiment. Uh, we'll have uh, some experiments in, cardio, uh, in uh, studying the cardiovascular uh, system and uh, some regulatory functions of cardiovascular and breathing and uh, 
and we'll test uh, new equipment for uh, and new methodology for uh, future experiments. Uh, you see, we'll have a new, maybe in two years, uh, Russian segment uh, will be fulfilled, by, uh, not fulfilled, but fulfilled by the uh, new research module, big research module, MLM or. Uh, MRM in English, and uh, we'll have there a uh, lot of uh, scientific experiments, a lot of scientific equipment for different experiments in different areas, and we'll have a serious uh, intentions to perform uh, the biomet experiments of new generation using ultrasound uh, and electrocardiography and uh, uh, in many many different kinds of uh, equipment. Uh, nowadays equipment, so we'll have a lot of work. You will have as a subject, <laughs> yes, and you will have a lot of work as the operators of experiments in in other kinds of scientific disciplines. Tell me a little bit about the other sort of scientific research that uh, you and your crewmates will be involved in. Uh, well, uh, you see. We have uh, different areas in our in Russian scientific scientific program. We have different areas of investigations: fundamental physics, uh, geophysics, uh, research, astronomy, uh, biology, medical experiments, uh, some education educational experiments. So, about biomed, I've told already, and uh, about uh, we have a. Uh, uh, beautiful experiment, by my opinion, in fundamental physics called plasma crystal. It's a fundamental research, uh, example of fundamental researches in, uh, f in physics. Uh, uh, the specialists will investigate with our help uh, the um, dust plasma uh, in, some, um, in some conditions and uh, ordered dust plasma in uh, this environment uh, and um, applications the field of applications of this knowledge uh, will be huge from maybe uh, nanotechnologies to cosmology you see uh, yes they really have an applications and some ideas to uh, for uh, to apply uh, this knowledge for forming of uh, planetary systems, uh, for planetary oh, clouds, uh, it's a cosmology. In some um, areas, uh, in technologies, uh, Earth technologies, uh, in uh, with uh, radioactive materials, so in atomic industry, and uh, in uh, some growing crystals controlling grow, growing of crystals, so it's a huge amount. I, s I said, from nanotechnology to cosmology. <laughs> uh, along with the science research, there is, of course, regular maintenance that uh, crew members on the station will do. And the current plan for your mission is calling for three spacewalks from the Russian section of the station in the latter part of the year. Uh, Tell me about who will be going outside on these EVAs and what work will be done. You see, I am uh, too, uh, not too old to uh, these EVAs, but I decided uh, not to participate in these EVAs. So, um, I'll support it, but I decided uh, that uh, two EVAs will perform Fyodor Yurchikhin from Expedition 25 and uh, Alek Skripachka. And the third one, uh, Alek will perform with Dmitry Kondratyev from the next crew. But I'll be a supporter, but I am ready to, perf to do uh, something extraordinary, if necessary. So I am ready for uh, any for uh, EVA, and I am ready to perform typical uh, operations. So, uh, but I am not involved in this uh, in the, these EVAs. You have made a lot of EVAs of your own already. Uh, not not many, not a lot of EVAs. I, I have only five EVAs. It's not so many, but. Uh, 
each of these EVA was with some uh, big peculiarities and uh, I can say that three of these EVAs I performed uh, not being trained on the earth, on the ground to these EVAs. So I had only onboard trainings and do, it, and do them. So it's the most interesting for me. <laughs> uh, and um, all of these EVAs will be aimed to scientific purposes. It's for scientific purposes. To install uh, a new working place for scientific, uh, uh, scientific uh, equipment, to install uh, some items of equipment, to uh, re to reinstall, to demount, and to bring back, in the uh, say like expose its uh, the materials uh, of uh, European Space Agency, uh, some and maybe some biological objects exposed from the expedition uh, 18. Then uh, robotic, uh, it's a European uh, experiment. Uh, for robotic arms and uh, uh, exp not um, studying the um, studying the qualities and uh, ability to work in different uh, modes uh, for robotic joints for uh, some effectors for some motors uh, and uh, it's uh, working maybe for five years already. So they are interested to, to take it, uh, to bring it back and uh, to return to the Earth some of the details of this equipment. We will install the equipment for uh, laser communications, communications by laser beams and, uh, and many other experiments. The current plan for uh, the sequence of events in your flight calls for shuttle Discovery to arrive at the station on mission STS-133 in November. Uh, can you tell me just a little bit about what's on the agenda for when you get that uh, shuttle visit near the end of the year? I don't know exactly the uh, flight plan and the uh, cargo and the payload of this uh, of this uh, flight, but uh, I'm looking forward uh, to meet with uh, Steve Lindsay, this uh, crew commander, because we worked uh, very tightly uh, on the Earth, assigning crews and uh, discussing the crew tasks uh, in MCUP, so multilateral crew operations panel, and now we can. Meet, we can meet on board the ISS. So for me, for both of us, it's very interesting and very exciting. <laughs> well, we're looking at the uh, at STS-133 bringing that permanent multi-purpose module and adding another room onto the station. And then early in the next year, uh, STS-134 will come and it will, will bring the alpha magnetic spectrometer. Uh, and at that point, you'll have the opportunity to see uh, your commander Scott Kelly on orbit with his twin brother. Yes, yes. And I, <laughs> and I had many thoughts about how to how to distinguish them, how not to mix them. <laughs> STS-134 before, before <laughs> closing the hatches. <laughs> the, the shuttle mission that Mark Kelly is commanding is the last scheduled flight of the space shuttle program and so you will be on board to see that as well. Uh, what are your thoughts about the space shuttle's place in the history of human spaceflight and its role in building the space station? Uh, it was a good and very interesting vehicle uh, during the whole program. It's uh, almost 30 years, almost 30 years. And uh, it was amazing program. Uh, it was amazing program, and a huge amount of astronauts flew on board shuttle. So it seems to me that uh, at least uh, 75 or 80 percent of uh, of us American astronauts flew on board shuttle, and only maybe 20 or 25 percent of all 
the cosmos. All, all the astronauts flew on different types, like Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. Uh, so uh, the contribution to the space program uh, of the shuttle is huge, is amazing. Uh, and uh, as to ISS, uh, let's see, uh, almost one third of all the shuttle flights were performed uh, for ISS, beginning from STS-88, uh, it was the first flight to ISS, uh, excluding maybe two or three flights, uh, like uh, for Hubble servicing, it seems me two flights, and one was Columbia, unfortunately, Columbia STS-107. Uh, so almost uh, 30, 45, 45 of 134, one third, exactly. So ISS uh, cannot uh, cannot be built uh, in this uh, shape, in these uh, uh, forms, in these sizes, uh, without shuttle. So what, what shall I? What can I say anymore? Well, and thank you, thank you, shuttle, <laughs> for doing this. When the shuttle is not flying a major means of supplying the space station will be gone, but there are three other proven cargo ships that are flying to supply the station, and each of them is supposed to make at least one visit to the station during Expedition 26. Uh, tell me briefly about the capabilities of these unpiloted Russian, European, and Japanese cargo ships. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Yeah, well, they are very different, they are very different. Say, uh, first, uh, Progress and uh, European ATV vehicle can dock, uh, can dock directly to the station from the autonomous flight, and uh, Japanese HTV uh, can be docked only by a station manipulator, so it goes to the uh, to the close vicinity of the station, then uh, stays there, and then uh, manipulator controlled by the operator from station captured it and dock to the docking port, special docking port. It's the first difference. Then I can say that <coughs> they have uh, different cargos, different possibilities to deliver cargos necessary to the station. HTV can deliver uh, dry cargo liquids and uh, cargos, not, not liquids, only dry cargos, uh, f uh, mainly for uh, Japanese modules. It's, it's uh, like logistic flights, but it, it can deliver, it can deliver uh, the cargos both in uh, pressurized volume or outside uh, on the unpressurized platform. Uh, ATV cannot uh, deliver uh, unpressurized cargos uh, in, um, outside the pressurized volume. Uh, Progress can deliver uh, some special modifications of Progress and we had uh, this experience on Mir, on board Mir. Now we, it's not necessary for us, but we are ready, uh, Russian side is ready to modify uh, the Progress to deliver uh, some uh, unpressurized cargos. Uh, so, but um, ATV and Progress are like uh, in the uh, s in the big city, uh, some uh, cargo cargo vehicles or cargo cargoiki cargo cargo vehicles in the cities trucks trucks big truck and small truck. You need both of them. You need both of them. So uh, they are necessary both. Uh, but I can say that uh, progress can dock uh, in uh, any conditions, in any conditions, and uh, it can be manually controlled by the crew. 
ATV cannot be controlled by the crew. So we are only monitoring the automated approach and uh, final approach and uh, we can only stop it uh, to be secure, to, to secure on the safe station, not more. So they are very different, but uh, and they are very similar in their functions. And you add to that the, uh, the oncoming uh, work that NASA is doing to try to bring in uh, private cargo ships. So there are lots of different ways to bring things, bring supplies to the International Space Station in the future. I'd like to ask you to look beyond that into the, to the further future and, and tell me where you think human spaceflight is headed in the next 20 or 50 years or so. And, and how is the International Space Station going to help prepare us for that future? I hope uh, that we will be aimed to the interplanetary flights and uh, the um, ISS or, or uh, future space station will be a platform for, uh, for doing some activities for, uh, to get ready for these interplanetary flights. Ta uh, uh, testing uh, equipment, uh, methodology, some computer systems and so on, some software. Um, and of course uh, we'll work, I hope we'll work together in cooperation and in international partnership. And uh, what else? What, uh, and we'll try uh, new approaches, new approaches to perform uh, some, um, maybe say, uh, already ordinary tasks like, uh, like uh, inject, inject, uh, injecting to the low Earth orbit cargos by maybe private cargo ships like Dragon, like Cygnus, like some others. Uh, it's very interesting for me and I think that it's, uh, this feature will be very interesting for uh, our agencies to improve the uh, economy of uh, this activity.